it got real queer. Don't think I've ever hated a protagonist this much. Yeah, in case you were wondering whether or not my channel is for kids, now you have your answer. Do you know what I would be if I talked to my mama that way? I just spilled red wine all over my new pillow. I've had this pillow for 12 hours. Books can hurt people, and unfortunately, this book did harm Trini reviewers. Merry Christmas, booktube. Oh my God, when will it end? <sighs> and I had to ask myself, what would and wouldn't I do in the name of justice for people that I love? It is time to decorate an NB's home for Christmas. Because I'm an overachiever, while I started decorating, the decorating process, I then decided I wanted to completely redesign my apartment. I've already moved some stuff around, but I wanna give you kind of an update on what I'm thinking. So this is my Christmas tree. I am either gonna put the Christmas tree right underneath that Targaryen flag. I just moved my bookshelf to have it be kitty corner. I'm in the process of taking out a bunch of books, putting the books that I have already kind of read or just don't wanna display in my closet. There's also a chance I might put my Christmas tree in that corner. But yeah, my big project for now is taking out all of these books. Then I'm going to decorate my TBR shelf for Christmas and put up my tree. This TV was previously right here. I decided to move it over there. This couch is where my TV currently is. Yeah, so my apartment is a disaster right now, but I will get it figured out. I find it so interesting that as I'm literally in the middle of filming this Black Girl Magic vlog, Sydney of Sydney Stories made a post about it on Twitter <laughs> and I just saw the notification for the tweet and the tweet really moved me. So I have it inserted here if you'd like to read it, but 
it just means the world to me that black and non-black folks alike are just really loving and watching these videos. And these are the favorite videos that I put out on my channel. Black girls absolutely deserve to have books about them analyzed and critiqued from an own voices perspective. That's so, so very important. I'm doing my meal prep for the week and I've become a really big fan of kind of poke bowl style eating. So I am baking salmon. I'm also roasting some eggplant and then I'm going to be making a roasted medley of jalapenos, kale, and cherry tomatoes and I'm just gonna have them prepped so that I can throw it over cauliflower rice or sticky rice and just eat throughout the week at my leisure it's going to keep me from continuing to eat fast food fried food just crappy food overall that isn't nutritious for my body and it's going to help me stay motivated on my mental and my physical health journey so I'm really excited about that if I'm eating fried food foods high in sugar foods that are low in nutrients I see a lot more of my PTSD symptoms arise I see myself sleeping less I'm a lot less less energetic and I can be very crabby. So I know that I need to change my diet. It's very, very important and I'm not gonna wait until 2020 to start doing that. I'm gonna start doing it right now. Doesn't bother me, but for this book in particular, I just know I want to read it in 2019. I don't know why I'm so specific. You just use a bunch of abstract metaphors for color and then you hope the rest of us figure it out. But she is stuck with Tamlin and has to ask complacent because we gotta make it really obvious that he's abusive. Tamlin, the way a woman can show how deceptively strong she is, is by saying there is a dialogue between Reese and Cassia. Reese says, You're about to have one hell of a day. No going back now, Cassia said to Reese. I just spilled red wine all over my new pillow. I've had this pillow for 12 hours. I just started this book and this girl has lost her damn mind. She said to her mother, I have no desire to honor your questions with a response. Girl, do you know what I would be if I talked to my mama that way? A memory. I would be a memory. Ain't nobody talking to their mama like that. Fuck on my face. Friday, December 6th, and I couldn't be more excited. I have today off from work to just read and celebrate Black Girl Magic. I have been running around nonstop all week between filming. Yesterday, I filmed two videos. It was like an hour and a half each of raw footage. It took me literally all night to get that video edited and uploaded and rendered and all of that fun stuff. And now it's live and it was my November Sip Spy unboxing slash booktube awards nomination round one. And I am so excited that the video is out. So if you haven't watched it, please, please, please give it a watch. It would mean the absolute world to me. I honestly think I really needed a lazy day at home just being cocooned in with my books and my tea. And I'm so freaking excited that I have that. Um, I have a friend coming over later. They are coming over because I pressed a button on my remote for my Bluetooth speaker and now I can't get audio. And it's been three weeks that I've been trying to fuss around and figure out how to make audio work on my Bluetooth again. I am the most technologically illiterate person that has ever existed. And so I finally put my pride aside and was like, can you please come over and help me with this and I will make you dinner. And they graciously said yes. So they are coming over later tonight. So up until then, I'm just going to be reading. I'm going to finish The Deep and I'm going to see how far I can get in Queen of the Conquered. But before I do that, I wanted to do some unboxings. So I try to save my unboxings for my Black Girl Magic vlogs just so that y'all can get a sneak peek at my hauls and my bow ties and my goodies or whatever. These videos mean so much to me. So I try to give y'all as many goodies as possible in them. The first thing that I want to unbox, I already know what it is. It's my freaking comics. So I allowed a acquaintance to borrow 
some beloved comics. That was four months ago. And they just weren't giving them back. So I hit them up two months ago and I was like, hey, uh, I really miss my comics. You know, can you mail them back? And they were like, yeah, I will. Eventually. And I was like, excuse me? Um, no, that's not how this works. So I waited a couple weeks and tried to be patient and then I messaged them again and I was like, hey, I would like my comics to be in the mail by Thursday, thanks. And then they left the message on red and didn't reply and I was like, oh no, 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 we're not doing this. I've had comics stolen from me twice before. My Vision comics by Tom King were stolen from me by a friend. Those were my most prized comics because I'm obsessed with Vision and I just haven't had the heart to replace them because the experience was so hurtful. I don't know, it's weird. I put them on my Amazon wish list, but for some reason I can't bring myself to buy another copy. I, is that weird? I don't know, but um, I miss my Vision comics all the time and then another friend stole comic books from me and I just wasn't gonna let it happen again. So about five days ago, I sent this person a rather long Instagram message. I was like, hey, you're being really rude and disrespectful. It's if somebody allows you to borrow something from them and ask for that property back, you should at the very least be giving a date and time that you're gonna return the property or try to make some effort or coordinate with them. Like this is a really awful thing to do to somebody. I also told them that if any of my comics were damaged, that they absolutely need to replace them before sending them to me. I'm nervous to see what they look like. Okay. So my saga volume one was returned and it looks it looks good. I'm not mad about this first issue of snot girl My first issue of Kim and Kim. This is one of my favorite comics of all time. It is super queer It involves bounty hunters. It is Latinx. It's amazing and one of my most prized comic book possessions Monstrous by Marjorie Liu illustrated by Sana Takeda. I have talked about this comic so very much so if you um, why is there water damage on this? This is, and then the bottom of it has water damage. So it looks like I'm gonna have to be replacing this, but at least I have it back. You know, that's, oh my God. If you borrow comics from somebody, please treat them with respect. If you borrow something from someone, please return it in an expeditious, respectful manner. Like, I will never, as long as I live, I will never let somebody borrow another comic book from me. That's, that ship has sailed. <sighs> Whatever, I'm just, honestly, I'm just glad that they're home. I honestly have no idea what this is. I forgot for Black Friday <laughs> that I ordered a vibrator. <laughs> the company also sent me this aphrodisiac and pheromone infused scented massage oil. Look, I have no sex life, okay? So it's about to be me, myself, and I. <laughs> But in case you're wondering what I got, this is the Satisfier 2 Next Generation. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, in case you were wondering whether or not my channel is for kids. Now you have your answer. This next box is a huge chunky monkey sent to me by Simon and Schuster in celebration of Blackathon. Blackathon is a readathon that I host with Francina Simone and Lauren from the novel Lush. We hosted the first and only Blackathon last February, and it was all through the month of February, a time for reading books that center black characters. The response for Blackathon was bigger and better than I ever expected. You're gonna see a haul for this in February where I'm gonna give complete synopses, but I wanted to give my Black Girl Magic viewers a sneak peek. So the first book that I have here is called Jazz Owls. This book is by Margarita Engel, and it says it's a novel of the Zoot Suits riots. I don't know anything about that. I don't know much about Zoot Suits, I'm not gonna lie, although I've always been, y'all know I love dapper fashion, so I love photos of people wearing Zoot Suits. I should start a Zoot Suit photography wall. That would be really, really dope. A lot of us really love the jazz age for the fashion and the music. I'm really excited about reading this book and just look at the cover. Oh, this is something I would get tattooed. Okay, do you see this little illustration? Ignore my bad nails. But the next book that I have is Reaching for the Moon, the autobiography of NASA mathematician Katherine Johnson. I really want to read Hidden Figures. This book is going to go along perfectly with that book. I know that this book is gonna mean the world to some nerdy black girl somewhere, and I'm just, I can't wait to read it. Then we have a book that was one of my most anticipated releases of the year, and that is Sulwe by Lupita Nyong'o. <laughs> I've been waiting for this book for so long and I'm freaking out that Simon and Schuster sent it to me. Ooh, is there a note in here? Yes, there is a note in here. 
God, it's got that great, beautiful children's book smell. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Lupita is so beautiful. I cannot. The next book that I have is Parker Looks Up. This book is based off of the viral photo of Parker, who is a little girl who came across a photo, a beautiful photo of Michelle Obama in the White House. And someone snapped a photo of this little black girl looking up at Michelle Obama in awe. And now it is an illustrated children's book. I am so excited to read this. I feel like I'm gonna cry. I've heard amazing things about this. This book I am super excited about because it is by the music producer Timbaland. I wonder if there's audio that comes with this book. It's basically a book that you read to your kid when you are trying in vain to get them to go to sleep. And the last book that I have here is Counting the Stars, the illustrated version of Katherine Johnson's memoir. These books are all gonna go on display in my home. I love children's literature, and one thing that I really, really want in my home someday is rows and rows and shelves of children's lit books. I do have one more box here. This was sent to me by a subscriber who works at a library, and this subscriber is named Allison, so huge thank you to Allison. She wanted to have her library participate in Mythathon, which is the mythology readathon that I hosted this fall, um, and she said that she was gonna send me some swag and goodies. I have no idea what's in here. I'm so freaking excited. Nothing more satisfying than the sound of a box being ripped open, of wrapping paper being ripped open. Is that a tote? Oh my god! <laughs> it's a sugar skull. Um, what is it called? Like a squeezy stress ball? This is perfect because if you've been following my channel, you know that I got a stress cold and suffered an upper respiratory infection that turned into an ear infection because my stress levels were so high. So Wow, thank you. Oh my gosh, I love that. Oh my freaking gosh. Okay, so first of all, there's this really cute little pouch, um, which I love because I'm always losing my sticky tabs that I used to annotate my books with, and I'm always looking for more pouches to stuff sticky tabs in. But mo more importantly, it's stuff with buttons. I'm obsessed with buttons. This is so cool. These buttons are all based off of mythology. Shut the fuck up. This is a Hades button. Oh, it's Oya. Oh my God. I now have a button of the goddess Oya. Y'all remember I cast Lauren from the novel Lush as Oya in the readathon to celebrate the element of air, and I couldn't think of a better person on booktube to represent Oya. Here is, wow, okay, there it goes. A button for the Parkchester Library. This one says knowledge is power. This button is of the deity Nephthys, whom I'm not familiar with, so if you are familiar with Nephthys in mythology, please let me know down below who this wonderful person is. I feel like I'm wildly undeserving of this amazing box. What the heck? Oh my god. Okay, so Wow. Wow. Okay, so apparently the library made bookmarks showing how to get involved with Mythathon. Pick a god, read one or more themes related to your god, represent your team by asking staff for a team button to wear, attend the final celebration on October 9th to enjoy refreshments and share what you read with your fellow Mythathon readers. How are you gonna make my readathon better than I made it? That's amazing. Got a flame, read a hot and steamy book. I like that prompt, that one they came up with. Especially if kids are getting involved and using this as an excuse to read more books, that means the world to me. Tote bag, new tote, who dis? I love tote bags, totes are also something that I collect. Let me know if you'd like to see a tote bag collection video one day. It's just like full of Pencil? Shut up. The pencils say I love my library. Please let them be notebooks. They're notebooks. They're notebooks. They're notebooks. They're notebooks. They're notebooks. This is really cool because I like little notebooks to carry around and make lists in. And I'm always losing the pens that go with them. Oh my god, this is... Look at that. This is one of the coolest things I've ever received in my entire life. Wow, I feel wildly undeserving of this. Thank you so much, Allison. More pencils. What was I just saying? I was literally just talking about pouches and... Allison sent me a bunch of little pouches. I can put my ID in here, which is great for when I'm traveling. You guys know that I travel a lot. <gasps> There's headphones in them. Oh my God. There's headphones in these. I feel like this is New York Public Library's way of being like, be fucking quiet, bitches. Is it Christmas? I also received a bunch of these little journals. Well, I was just about to buy a bunch of journals that I can make lists for, lists on and stuff like that, and now I don't need to. This is great because I can jot down like booktube ideas, video concepts, things like that, notes while I'm reading, which will make it easier for me to review my books. I'm so nervous. I feel like I'm already on the verge of tears and this is just gonna put me over the friggin' edge. Jesse. Please continue to be a creative, dynamic, inspirational booktuber, your friends in New York. <sighs> I talk a lot about impact on this channel, 
And I think a lot about impact every day, about how the way that you treat people in the grocery store, the looks that you give people, the way that you treat the people in your personal life, the things that you say on the internet have effects. And every day we're creating ripples and we have no idea the extent of these ripples. Once we put something out into the world, whether that's a word, a video, whatever, we have no control or way of knowing how the world is then going to receive it and be affected by it, but everything matters. I remember when I was creating Mythathon, all I wanted was to get people interested in mythology, to educate myself in mythology, to bring a bunch of people together and talk about old stories because those old stories, those old myths, are the reason that we have the stories that we have today. Again, ripples. I just, I can't believe that Mythathon affected people over at the New York Public Library so much that they were willing to send me this, that they were willing to take Mythathon and then impact you know, kids and adults who participate in their public library. I'm really, really overwhelmed and floored and I, I feel like I don't deserve this. So thank you for being better to me than I feel I deserve. I'm so excited for Mythathon next year in 2020. I am going to be focusing on under-celebrated myths in various cultures of color, and I'm very, very excited about that. I intentionally had round one of Mythathon focus on a lot of Greek mythology because I wanted to get people interested in the concept of Mythathon, and I've already started planning it. I already um, am coordinating with the hosts. It's going to be a thing on Bookstagram and on Booktube, and I'm hoping it's gonna be a way to kind of marry those very separate parts of the book community and I'm just I'm really really excited I hope my friends at the New York Public Library like it even better in 2020 than they did in 2019 on that note if I keep talking I'm gonna start crying so I'm going to reheat my tea oh it's still at a good temperature um, and I'm gonna get back into some books We have a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. It is now December 9th. For the last couple days, I have just been watching Christmas movies because I got Disney Plus. <coughs> Do you ever breathe too quickly and then you aspirate your own saliva and then you have to fight for your life? And my friend did come over and fix my TV and then we just started watching a bunch of Christmas movies yesterday. And I wanted to show you the present that my friend brought me and it is Queenie by Candace Cardi Williams. This is a Waterstone UK special edition. You can only get this through Waterstones. I read this book, I think in March of this year and I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. I feel like the majority of people who read this book hated it, I feel sad for them. I was one of the people that absolutely could not put this book down. I gave it five out of five stars and you're gonna definitely be seeing me talk about this in my end of the year favorite books videos. This book is also signed by Candace Cardi Williams, which I'm really, really excited about, but I have questions about her signature. Girl, what are you doing? <laughs> I do have more boxes to open up for y'all, but I think I just need to put unboxings aside because we, we, we gotta talk about these 
about these books, dog. I have thoughts. Exactly halfway through this book, and I wanted, I'm devouring this book rapidly, but I wanted to check in with y'all first before I finish the book, just to see if any of my opinions on the first half of the book are changed by the contents in the later half of the book. So I went into this book not knowing anything about it. I did that intentionally. And the synopsis basically, we have a main character named Sigourney whose family has acquired a lot of wealth and power and one day her entire family is slaughtered. She escapes very narrowly with her life and then goes into exile. Sigourney has dreamed of absolutely nothing her entire life. I believe that she's now 20 years old. Her entire life she's dreamed of exacting revenge on those who killed her family. And the world in this story is ruled by the Fjern. The Fjern are pale skinned people who came to the islands where Sigourney's people lived generations ago and seized power and enslaved the people of the islands. Now in this world there exists something called craft and the Fjern have decided that it is their divine right and their divine right alone to possess craft. So anybody who is found in possession of craft that is not a Fjern are ruthlessly executed and Sigourney is the exception to this rule because through a series of events she and her family secured a position among themselves in the Fjern's elite royal families and now has some measure of protection from subjugation. So through no small amount of scheming, Sigourney has found herself kind of in charge of this island, but she's really the overseer. She basically has a plantation and owns slaves, and her goal is to manipulate her way into being named regent of all the land by the dying king so that she can seize power over absolutely everything and wipe out the royal families who killed her family. Sigourney has craft, which allows her to read minds and manipulate people's decisions. She can make people kill themselves. She can implant thoughts into people's heads. She can do a lot of things with her abilities and she is allowed to have this craft not only because of her position of power but because she was born as a free woman and not as a slave. Now her justification for owning slaves is that she will need the power that the slaves grant her in order to potentially be named regent over the land and then she can avenge her family by killing all of the land's royalty and then ideally liberating all of the slaves. So she's like it's okay that I own slaves because when I am named queen of everything I'm gonna free all of the slaves. Okay, so that is the premise of the story. There is absolutely no sparing of discussion of slavery and what happens to slaves. There is major trigger warnings for rape, for violence, for torture, for psychological manipulation, for child death, pretty much all kinds of trigger warnings. There's a lot of gore in this book as well, which definitely caught me off guard. I don't mind gore in my books or violence in my books, especially in my fantasies, but definitely be aware of that going into this book. I'm first gonna talk about the things I really am enjoying about this book before I go into the things I want to rant about because I have a lot, a lot, a lot of ranting to do about this book. A lot. When I opened this book and I got through the prologue, I was stunned by how wonderfully and deliciously well written the prologue was. The writing just absolutely is so fast paced. It puts you right in the story and it just makes you want to fly through the book. Like I'm reading this literally unable to put it down because I want to know what what is coming next. Now full disclaimer, I absolutely love the author Kaysen Collender. I met them at BookCon. Kaysen is phenomenal. I follow them on Twitter. I think that they're hilarious and I love their politics and I really really like who they are as a person. But y'all know that I'm always going to be honest in my, my reviews. I'm always going to give you my 100% honest thoughts and so that's exactly what I'm about to do. So um so anything that I say is absolutely no shade on Kaysen as a person because like I said, I absolutely adore them and I'm gonna continue and to follow and support them. One of the things that I love the most about this book is that it is definitely portraying a truly morally ambiguous character. And what I mean by that is a lot of times when we get representation for morally ambiguous characters, those characters are written as so understandable and so almost like barely even a little morally ambiguous and barely even a little evil that it's, it's so easy to root for them. Sigourney is not a character like that. You definitely have wildly mixed feelings on the things that she does because on the one hand, she wants to do good things, but on the other hand, she's doing some incredibly awful things. Incredibly awful. So I appreciate the representation for an actually morally ambiguous character. It's very, very difficult to write a character like that. I love that this book is just literally 1000% a celebration of Caribbean island culture. There's so much focus on water and what water means to the islanders. So much love is put into the description and the climate and the scenery and even things like the fruits that fall off of the trees. It really just feels like a love affair to the Caribbean. I'm also just dying at the way that dark skin and dark features are described. My mother was beautiful with black hair curling atop her head, skin as dark as the purples of the night sky, brown eyes lined by lashes so thick it's as though she wore coal. 
and a proud wide nose sitting above an even wider mouth. Yes, just the celebration of how wide and strong these features are is something that I rarely ever see depicted in fantasy. And, and, I, and if I do get to see it, it's only because a black author wrote it. So many fantasy books that are written by white authors depict those same exact features as unattractive and just to see them depicted as centering of beauty is so beautiful and I'm absolutely living for it. And I know that Kaysen did that on purpose, so just chef's kiss to them. I think it's really cool that a lot of the families, the names, the uh, the names of the buildings are all very, very Nordic. They're names I can't even pronounce because they're so freaking Nordic, but that's cool to see that in a fantasy. And I wasn't expecting to see that in an Afro-Caribbean fantasy. So I like that two very distinct cultures are put together. I feel like a lot of times our fantasies have very like British European names versus Nordic Icelandic European names. So I just thought that was very new and refreshing. And Kaysen inputs a lot of very very specific messages about slavery and how being a slave impacts the way that you interact with people of your race. How that degradation, the psychological, the physical torture has drastic effects on the people who are suffering it, how it changes their culture, their mindset, the way that they interact with one another. Kaysen is doing an amazing job showing the repercussions of slavery for those who are enslaved. There are so many tropes in this book that I personally enjoy like political intrigue, multiple families vying for one spot, exception manipulation, power. So those are all the things that I'm really absolutely enjoying about this book. And now we, we need to talk about the things that I... Let's talk about Sigourney. Sigourney is doing some horrible things in the name of avenging her family. By awful things, I mean that she is the overseer on an island and she has slaves that she is strategically using in order to gain power for herself. And when I first read that really early on in the book, I was like, whoa that is so wildly inexcusable but then i stopped and thought and i had to ask myself honestly how far would i go to avenge my family what would and wouldn't i do in the name of justice for people that i love and i still don't know the answer to that question i don't know if i would be doing anything differently than Sigourney is doing. And I think it's very hard to say how you would respond if you aren't in that situation. Especially because enduring slavery and seeing slavery every day, and not just slavery, but other types of extreme marginalization, they warp you to the suffering of others. When you experience day in and day out suffering, it is so hard to continue to have empathy and respect even for people who look exactly like you because you're constantly seeing them be disrespected. I low key, hate Sigourney's character. There is a sequel to this book. The book cover just got released recently and I am praying, I am praying that Sigourney dies in this book and the next book is us following the character who killed her and we get a whole different storyline because I detest and loathe her character so deeply even though I try not to condemn her actions too much. And, and that makes it really hard for me to talk about her because on the one hand I do understand her but on the other, I still find her reprehensible. The biggest point of contention with her character is that she is 1000% a rapist. That's not something I can ever excuse for anybody. Friedrich follows me up the winding stairs, closes the door behind him and allows me to kiss him without complaint. He lets me press myself against his body, wrapping my arms around the back of his neck. So for context, Friedrich is one of Sigourney's slaves and she solicits him for sex, you know, pretty much whenever she desires. And she talks so much about how she reads his mind and in his mind, Friedrich is thinking that he loves her. Friedrich tells her verbally that he does consent to have sex with her, but there's no such thing as being able to truly consent to somebody who has so much power over you. Sigourney herself also wonders if Friedrich is only tricking himself to think that he loves and wants to have sex with her so that he doesn't have to realize the horror of his own situation. That is so disgusting and messed up and she continues to have sex with him, absolutely knowing that what she's doing is rape. He truly believes he loves me, but this love isn't real. It's imagined, a story he tells himself. I'm not deserving of this false love even as I take it and use it to comfort myself. Later on in the book, she tries to force herself upon another slave and when he rejects her, I should have him removed as my personal guard and lock him in the library again or have him executed but I still can't help but keep him close to me as though I think there's a chance I can convince him that I'm worthy of his respect and that I deserve the love of my people here's a tip if you're trying to convince somebody that they're worthy of your love and respect maybe don't try to rape that person 
just just a pro tip. Obviously, these actions on the part of Sigourney are absolutely 1000% unacceptable. They're morally reprehensible. But on the other hand, I respect that Kaysen wrote her character this way because I feel like Kaysen is showing that there's no way to ethically own slaves, whether you are physically or sexually abusing them or not. If you own slaves, you're an unethical person, no matter what your justification is. Sigourney talks a lot in this book about how she's better than other slave owners because she doesn't beat her slaves or punish them or make them do grueling labor. And then she spends a lot of time whining about how it hurts that the slaves don't like her and it hurts her that the slaves think that she's a bad person and she's <laughs> upset and bitter that she doesn't have the love of her people and um, she talks a lot about how when her mother was alive the slaves loved her and the only difference between her and her mother is that her mother spent a lot of time trying to take care of the slaves and showing that she actually cared about them and that she was invested in their liberation while Sigourney just stays up in the palace whenever she can and avoids them and just whines about how much they hate her. I, she's made no attempt to build any kind of camaraderie with them or even to promise them that they will be free at some point in time. I just, I don't like her character. She spends so much time whining. I also don't think that she's a very intelligent character which makes it hard for me to relate to her at all because the decisions that she makes are so wildly unwise. She's very cunning and ambitious, but she's not smart. Why do the slaves hate me the way they do? Shouldn't they be glad to see one of their own free and among the, the Kongleg? The Kongleg is the name of the ruling people. I know I'm not saying that correctly. Rather than meeting me with love and thanks, I'm met with such hatred. No, I'm sorry. Seeing one person succeed while the rest of your people are marginalized, enslaved, raped and murdered on a daily basis is not enough to make those people feel grateful and good. That's just not how oppression works. So besides the fact that I hate Sigourney and I hope she dies a fiery, slow death at the, by the end of this book, the other things that are really driving me nuts about this book is 1000% telling and not showing. The author does spend a lot of time just very clearly laying out what's going on in the world, the history, the backstory, just telling you as the reader. And uh, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. However, However, it's, it's not actually bothering my enjoyment of the story because I love the writing so much, which has never happened for me before. Some of the social justice themes are just very, very repetitive and heavy handed. The reader isn't allowed to make up their own conclusions or dissect anything from the text. It's all laid out for them, which is another one of my big pet peeves. Also early on in the book, she talks about how there is one slave, her favorite slave, uh, the one who's been with her the longest and helped save her life is the only slave that she granted freedom. And even though she granted to this slave her freedom the slave stays by her side anyway which is a trope that I just I just don't care for and of course this slave is very very sassy and is the only one who Sigourney allows to talk back to her and the sassy submissive servant trope is just overdone for me I don't want to see it anymore so there's a scene where her sassy servant is talking back to her and she says, I find her honesty refreshing. Oh my god, the only reason that she's free to be honest with you is because you granted her her freedom. I hate Sigourney as a character. I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. I don't think I've ever hated a protagonist this much. But, but, if by the end of this novel, she does not face real repercussions for her actions, we are gonna have a major problem, a major frickin' problem. Like, I don't mind the fact that her character is written with so many flaws as a person because I think people are flawed but it will drive me up a wall if she doesn't have if she doesn't face any repercussions for those flaws if she doesn't get punished for the fact that she's a rapist that she's entitled that she's acting like she's the only one of her people that's ever suffered and what does it mean that you've decided that because your family was killed you were going to keep a bunch of other families oppressed so that you can exact your own grand plan. And the justification again is like, oh, I'm gonna free all the slaves. But you get the sense while reading the book that that free all the slaves thing is very, very secondary and minor. And I have a feeling that she would be doing this whether or not the slaves get to be free at the end of it. Next book I have is The Deep. I am reading this for, we are reading this for the NB Book Club, which is the non-binary book club that I host. The Deep is by non-binary author River Solomon and it talks about what would happen if the captured Africans who were taken aboard transatlantic slave ships had jumped into the ocean and instead of drowning, they had survived. We are following a mer creature named Yetu and Yetu is chosen as her people's historian. So because of the extreme grief and agony that these people faced because of where they came from, they pretty much appoint one person out of their entire civilization to hold and bear the weight of all of their memories and trauma. And then once a year, they kind of gather around 
around this person and they remember remembering every single day what happened to you that trauma the pain of your ancestors is too much so they force one person to bear it all the time while the society bears it only one day a year if that makes any sense or I'm absolutely loving the oceanography and ocean science I love the way that the bodies of the murder people are crafted it's just so amazing River Solomon is excellent at building atmosphere and world and culture and it's just so good there's really robust disability and autistic rep in the store it's done in a very casual and seamless and integrated way that I heavily appreciate but yay to our main character also suffers very very severe anxiety depression PTSD and self-harm issues and Yetu's character is somebody that I relate to a lot because she's so misunderstood. Her people don't recognize the signs and symptoms of mental illness. They don't understand it. It's incomprehensible to her. And I think that this is so reminiscent of the struggles that many of us black folk face within various black communities of our communities just not recognizing and understanding our mental illness. Black women's mental health has always been pushed aside both within the black community and outside of it. And of course men too, and gender non-conforming black folks as well, just do not get listened to about mental illness, having mental illness or exhibit signs of mental illness. And so seeing how her community doesn't recognize the way that the rememberings as they are called is traumatizing and causing extreme mental issues for Yetu is is a very, very important and prevalent theme in the story. Yetu is like, you know what, enough is enough. And she gives all of the memory back to her people and dips out. She's like, I need to figure out who I am. I'm not enduring this pain alone anymore so she leaves and goes to find herself on this journey she meets human beings and this book has one of my favorite tropes which is human beings being observed through the perspective of a non-human entity there's something about that trope that is just so funny and sharp and witty and I just love seeing the A2 be completely confounded as to human behavior and culture and customs there's also really fantastic non-binary rep in the story one of the themes that I wanted to talk about is kind of about black trauma porn. Yetu wanted people to remember how she remembered with screams. She had no wish to transform trauma to performance, to parade what she'd come to think of as her own tragedies for entertainment. And there's no way that this line is not a direct commentary on how black people are expected to talk about our trauma. We're expected to be seen in pain and suffering in books and in movies specifically for the pleasure and benefit of white audiences. She later says, oh, was this pain real? It doesn't even belong to her. Was there anything about her that wasn't a performance for others' gratification? There are just lines like that that really hit me heavy. There's so much to dissect in this book. It's wildly rich. My only issue with this book is that I am not feeling the emotional investment and emotional impact that I should be feeling. I keep reading this book expecting to feel drawn in, to be invested. And I just, I don't, I feel so much disconnect from the story and it, and it makes me really, really sad because I expected this to be one of my top favorite books of the year. I still have 40 pages left and I've heard the audiobook, which is read by W. Diggs is incredible. So I'm going to reread the book via audio just to see if I get a different emotional response to it. I'm hoping that something happens in the next 40 pages that will make me feel more connected and invested in the story. And I just don't know what it is that makes me feel so dispassionate about this this tale. So we'll see. I am going to go back to reading and watching the Santa Claus. Y'all saw me make pancakes earlier today and I have leftovers so I'm gonna have pancakes for dinner. I made dark chocolate walnut raspberry pancakes from scratch with crispy bacon and just <sighs> my whole heart. I'm so nervous because I love both of these authors so much and also I have given every single book that I've read for my Black Girl Magic series so far like 4.5, at, at least four stars, just because I've genuinely enjoyed them that much. Really, really hoping that these books don't mess up my streak, but we'll see. <sighs> Oh my God, I take back everything that I said about not being interested in the story. It got real queer and real, real sexy. And I'm just like so flustered after reading the scene and the conversation and it was so angsty and gay. And I'm just, I am invested. I like literally can't put this book down. <laughs> okay, we go finish this book real quick. Okay, okay, bye. Okay, so I finished The Deep and I will give you a review probably tomorrow or the next day and I'm back to reading Queen of the Conqueror. There's a heavy mystery element in this fantasy that I'm really appreciating and then you definitely find out that one of the characters is being manipulated and controlled mind, body, and soul by somebody but you don't know who it is and it's just 
it's really cool. So I'm currently reading this while watching Nosferatu on Shudder. Shudder is a horror streaming service and Nosferatu is a book that was written by Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. It's like a Christmas horror scary book. And I really enjoyed the book, so I figured I would start the TV show adaptation, and the TV show adaptation is amazing so far. I'm in episode four, and Zachary Quinto is starring in it, and I absolutely adore his acting. He's playing a man that's like 115 years old, and the makeup is amazing. I'm watching the show and flying through this book. Honestly, this book is just such a, it's like a guilty pleasure for me at this point. It's like bad good, you know what I'm saying? Like December 10th, I made breakfast oatmeal. I've got bacon simmering in the oven because I'm gonna make bacon roasted Brussels sprouts tonight. And I just wanted to give you guys an update on uh, Queen of the Conquered. So I'm on page 260 of about 350. And I have to say the repetitive writing has really gotten on my nerves. I'm no longer able to look away from it just because I love the writing. Um, it's getting really, really annoying. I'm officially- I'm officially annoyed. Multiple times per chapter, an idea will be stated and then that same exact idea will be reiterated on the very next page. And here's an example. So on page 260, the king tells his lifelong best friend, Lothar, to leave the room so that he and Sigourney can have a conversation. And Sigourney reads Lothar's mind and sees how confused he is because the king has never had a conversation without Lothar being in the room. He's never dismissed Lothar before. Lothar Nicholson wonders what the king could have to say to me. He and the king have always discussed their tactics and plans. And then she goes off pretty much for the entire page about how close he and the king are. Then on the next page, they kind of resume back to the present conversation and Lothar still has refused to leave the room. So the king says again, And hey, Lothar, you gotta get the fuck up out the room. Again, we are taken through another page of memories of how close the king and Lothar are, how they've always been the closest of friends, literally almost word for word, the same information we got on the previous page. And it's just gotten really annoying and I'm over it. I'm over it. Oh my God, when will it end? I'm on page 274 and I'm just, I'm so over it. A bunch of characters that I don't care about are getting killed and murdered. I don't even care who's murdering them at this point. I am 100% disinterested in the mystery of what's going on. Sigourney, thank God, has made some character development and growth. Overall, she's still doing nothing with her incredibly powerful craft besides reading the minds of people around her and then mourning when she inevitably realizes that everybody hates her. She hasn't executed any of her plans. The only thing that's really happened throughout the course of this book is a bunch of racist royalty getting murdered and just pages and pages recounting violence against slaves and I'm just... <sighs> I'm in different clothes because I had to change after my personal training session. I also went and got groceries for dinner, but I just had, I just had to update y'all because Sigourney is just, she is out of control. So one of her slaves tries to escape and she pulls, <laughs> when he's finally caught, she literally says, why did you run away? I treat you well, don't I? I let you come and go as you please. <laughs> Oh my fucking God. She really does not understand that being a slave, no matter how nicely your owner treats you, is not something that the slaves are gonna be grateful for. I cannot with this girl. Somebody get her. I believe that this is a sci-fi book. And I DNF'd it pretty quick. So for this one, and I know that this is a lot to do with what is Red Sister. So with Red Sister, this is an assassin uh, story. And for that she kept changing her story with the same people she talked Aspects that I believe the witch hunters are kind of based off of, and it's gonna be really, really cool to see the witch herself. And well, I'm in the middle of doing meal prep for the week, so that's why I'm in my kitchen, because I'm trying to watch over the, my things, make sure they don't burn. And Sigourney is trying to comfort this slave owner, and she tells him, it's impossible to be both a master and love your slave. Okay, but you expect your slaves to love you as a master. Not even four pages prior, she talked about wanting the love of her slaves. In particular, one slave, the one that she tried to forcibly have sex with, which I still can't get over because this particular slave is a slave that she knows has no sexual desire for her and knows 
that he hates her, but she still tried to bring him into her bed. How many pages is left again? Oh God, I've got 55 pages left. She doesn't know how badly I'd wanted his acceptance, how much I want the love of my people. I'm executing him, I know, to punish both him and the people who hold no love for me. All right, I'm gonna head out. unboxing time this box is from Amazon I got a electric kettle so I can stop using my pots a pack of toothpaste this was on sale for Black Friday whiteboard markers I'm so excited about these because they have erasers on them and they're magnetized so they can stick right to my whiteboard microfiber towels for drying curly and kinky hair this really awesome thermos because y'all know I'm a really big fan of tea drinking and I really need a thermos I got it in dark green and emerald because this is my second favorite color and yeah this is all of the stuff that I got for Black Friday I'm gonna use this right now to make some tea Dapper family, Merry Christmas Eve. I cannot believe it is finally Christmas Eve. It is truly the most wonderful time of the year. I just got out of the shower, as you can probably see, and I have been bopping the Kelly Clarkson 2013 Christmas album. I believe it's called Wrapped in Red. I don't know how I have gone the last five years without knowing about this album, but it has changed my life. It is so freaking good. And I'm a big fan of the Mariah Carey original Christmas album, but now I think the Kelly Clarkson album takes the cake. I honestly think that it's better the Mariah Carey's album. If you've heard both of them, please let me know if you think I'm tripping, which you prefer. Let me know in the comment section down below. I wanted to give y'all a reading update and let you know what my life is going like. So it's a family tradition that on Christmas Eve is when we open our presents. So this Christmas Eve, I'm going to be unboxing a few presents from those of you in the community. So I'm doing that at midnight because that's when we open our presents. I am so freaking excited. Currently drinking my coconut tea from the steeping room. This is a tea that I unboxed in my latest Sips By unboxing. There's a discount code in the description box of that video for this tea if you're interested. I pretty much just poured almond milk over it. It's so amazing and it's surprisingly Christmassy. I also wanted to show you this really cool package that I got from Penguin Random House. It's a promotional package for Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. If you are on Bookstagram, you know that Bookstagram has been freaking raving about this damn book. Some of my most trusted reviewers have been freaking out about this book. Arcs went out like a couple months ago and now it's showing up on everybody's top 10 list of the year so I, I had to score myself a copy. All I know about the story is that it centers a young black nanny and so there's a little box of Cheerios in here. There's also this really cute coloring page. Then of course we have the book itself. This is one of the most soothing and comforting and exciting vibrant covers I've ever seen in my life. I really really like it. So let's find out. Oh it was blurbed by Taylor Jenkins Reid. She called it a startling razor sharp debut. Wildly fun and breathtakingly wise. Deft and confidently confronting issues of race, class, and privilege I have to admit I'm in awe wow okay this has been blurbed by some really really powerful writers Alex Chamberlain is a woman who gets what she wants and has made a living with her confidence driven brand showing other women how to do the same we love she's shocked when her babysitter Amira Tucker is confronted while watching the Chamberlain's toddler one night the security guard sees a young black woman with a white child and accuses her of kidnapping a small crowd gathers a bystander films everything and Amira is furious and humiliated Alex reserves to make things right but Amira herself 
herself as aimless, broke, and wary of Alex's desire to help. At 25, she's about to lose her health insurance and has no idea what to do with her life. When the video of Amira goes public and unearths someone from Alex's past, both women find themselves on a crash course that will upend everything they think they know about themselves and each other. Empathy and piercing social commentary, such a fun age, explores the stickiness of transactional relationships what it means to make someone family and the complicated reality of being a grown-up. It's a searing debut for our time. Shut the fuck up. That is amazing. So yesterday I started reading The Stars and the Blackness Between Them by Janata Petras. I had a lot of errands to do and dishes to wash so I just popped the audiobook on and the audiobook blew me away. It's narrated by the author. Janata has this incredible cadence about her voice that just lulls you into the story. It sets the atmosphere. It pulls you right in. As y'all know this is a Penguin Random House debut about two girls, one from Trinidad and the other from Minneapolis who fall in love. The Trinidadian girl Audrey is sent to Minneapolis to live with her estranged father after her mother, her religious zealous mother, catches her kissing her girlfriend. I'm really freaking out about the themes in this book so far. The themes are so well done. We have a really heavy theme of black girls as celestial beings, the importance of the zodiac to black folk. I think a large part of the reason that so many of us black folks are really into the zodiac is because religion has been used to hurt us for so many generations so we no longer trust it and we, instead of that a lot of us are putting our faith in the universe and as black folks you know that we have a really strenuous relationship with Christianity in particular because throughout history religion has been taken away from us it's been forced upon us it's been used as a justification for slavery it's really cool to see a book with two black girls kind of finding their way through spiritualism especially because spiritualism is something that is very very centric in various afro communities I also really love the importance of nature in the story nature has also been used to oppress and hurt black people now we have this kind of fear of nature as black Americans. We have this fear of the woods. We have this fear of open plains because something about it reminds us of plantations, of slavery, of running through the woods to escape masters. And so over time that kind of evolved into the stigma that we have within ourselves about being in nature. So seeing this book where these two black girls are really grounded in nature and nature is being celebrated and they're kind of reclaiming their relationship to the earth is it was really special for me to see. That was one of my favorite things about the movie Queen and Slim was seeing two black people free in nature and not be scared of it. The importance of dreams is also really well tied in with those themes and I love the magical realism. But it also talks a lot about ancestral power and how we can derive power and strength from those who have come before us. And again, unfortunately as black folks, we have lost a lot of our ancestors, a lot of those roots, and so we've lost a big part of that power. And that's part of the reason why Audrey's relationship with her grandmother Queenie is so special to me because Audrey derives so much power from her grandmother's wisdom and Queenie is sharp she is funny she is unapologetic and I love having elder protagonists she's a really big part of the story and she says some of the most profound shit ever she also has just she's got so much magic it's very clear that she is a magical a celestial character and I think that so many of us in black and Latinx communities have that very magical magical grandmother, that very magical abuela. I most certainly do. I'm also really enjoying the power of dance and how that's being portrayed and represented in the story as well. References to black historic musicians, how they've influenced black culture and how they influence Mabel, our protagonist who lives in Minneapolis. Mabel's also got a really strong relationship with her dad. Her dad is a planter and again, I love that for him. I love seeing a black man build a relationship with nature unapologetically. You know, he's problematic in his own ways, but he's really devoted to learning and being a better person and that's something that I really, really love seeing represented. Mabel calls her daddy out for misgendering a black non-binary musician and I loved seeing a cisgender character just very casually stand up for non-binary folks for saying like no this person uses they them pronouns you shouldn't assume these things um, as black people we need to do better with this and I loved seeing that conversation take place within a black lens because I've said this before um, in so many black woke spaces uh, non-binary people non-binary black people are treated not great a lot of black folks don't support black people that are trans and trans non-binary that's a really big problem here in Minneapolis and a part of why I stepped away from the activist community in Minneapolis 
So seeing a black man kind of unlearn that is really, really special to me. And it was done in such a casual way. The use of neutral pronouns and the non-binary characters are like so, so casually done. There's also a Muslim best friend. Her name is Ursa, which is a name that I love every time I hear somebody with the name Ursa. I just feel warm feels about it because I just love that name and she wears hijab. So wow, I just stabbed myself in the face with the book. This book doesn't feel like it's cramming representation into the story. It just feels like it's representing all the ways that somebody can be black, just like Slay did. And I really, really love that. Like there's representation for girls that are curvy. Audrey is a very curvy, big hipped girl. I love seeing that and I love seeing her love and embrace her curves. And also like there are scenes where she's trying to shop for clothes in Minneapolis and she's like, like why are all the clothes made for people? people without hips. The voices of Mabel and Audrey are so distinct. You can definitely tell what perspective you're in per chapter without even having to see the headline. That's really incredible. And the queerness, the relationship between these two girls is really, really beautiful. The way that they're written has so much respect and love. Um, the ocean kissed our toes. Her lips on mine were a warmth and my body started to bloom within her arms and melt in her skin. And from then on, love was all we knew how to do. We worshiped each other's arms with our own devotion, sand in her braids and my Afro, our Sunday dresses wrinkled. We peeled down to our underwear and swam in the water and floated on eternity together. I have heard some very, very important criticism that I do want to share about the book. And I'm gonna share that at the end of the video. And I wanted to tell you what I'm going to be doing for Christmas. So because I did a lot of traveling this year and I saw my family earlier this month and then also in November um, I'm going to be staying here in Minnesota by myself for Christmas and Christmas is like a like the time that my family always comes together so it is a little weird to be alone on Christmas because of that I'm going to make this Christmas as special as I possibly can I'm going to be watching my favorite Christmas movies and I'm going keeping my mother's traditions alive of cooking so tomorrow I'm going to be making waffles I'm making my mother's famous stuffed mushroom recipe as well as my abuela's enchiladas recipe I'm also going to be having morir soñado for dessert as well as some ooey gooey caramel brownies I'm not really too bothered by the fact that I'm alone on Christmas Christmas because I know that at any point in time I can read your comments and just look back at our interactions and just having this community means that I'm never truly alone and I love that so much so thank you so much for being a part of my Dapper family for supporting me for watching my videos for hanging out and talking to me it just commenting I it really means the world to me the blackness between the stars is the melanin in your skin I love this book Merry Christmas booktube wow I cannot believe that y'all are really opening presents with me at midnight like I said this is a family tradition and y'all truly are my fam so I'm really really glad that I get to be doing this with you I'm gonna open this one first it's very thin so I feel like I'm gonna open this very carefully just so I don't rip potentially whatever is inside because it has to be a paper not paper it's a bow tie this oh my gosh who sent this okay so this is from my Amazon wish list it's, I don't have many pink bow ties and I love, I love the combination of pink and blue. What is this chastity belt? I love that this bow tie is <laughs> pink, blue, and white. I like cannot talk, I'm so excited. Just tell me this bow tie isn't the cutest thing ever, yo. I cannot wait to wear this. Holy frick, it's even cuter in person. Oh my gosh, okay, I need to find out who sent this. For Jesse, happy Christmas. I love you, love Chloe. Shut the front fucking door. Chloe, stop. Oh my fucking God, thank you so much, Chloe. You picked the freaking best bow tie off of my wish list. Thank you so freaking much. Also, I love that you said happy Christmas. You're so Australian. I'm dying. God, my friends are absolutely the best. I just like, I don't deserve y'all. Thank you so much, Chloe. Wow. Okay. Okay. So let's open this one. Also like, yes, I wrapped my own presents. Just let me live. Well, I knew that this is off my Amazon wish list because a package came from Amazon and I hadn't ordered anything, but I don't know what is inside. <gasps> Shut up! Oh my God! Oh my freaking gosh! Okay, somebody sent me Children of Virtue and Vengeance in... Shut the fuck up! Oh my God, it's even freaking prettier in person. 
Yo, especially with the movie adaptation coming out. Put this on my wish list, even though I haven't read the first one, because y'all said that you wanted me to read and review these books for my Black Girl Magic series. And so I was like, okay. But because I'm worried that I won't like this book because of things that I've heard. So I just put it on my wish list. That way somebody else can buy it for me. And thank you so much, whoever bought this. Who, who did this? Yo, okay. Thank you so much, Rachel from Rachel Mar- oh my god, Rachel. I cannot. Like, our friendship lights up my freaking life. Thank you so much, Rachel. You always know just what to do to put a smile on my face, whether that's like a kind word or a gift. You always know what to do. I cannot wait to read this book. Thank you so, so much from the bottom of my freaking heart. I know that it's small and shriveled, just like the Grinch, but I love you with it just the same. I'm super excited for this one. Um, the Fifth Elliot and I have been DMing each other, and I was telling them that I loved their handle because I'm a really, really big fan of the Fifth Element. I actually have a Fifth Element tattoo because I'm a huge nerd, and their name is a pun from the Fifth Element movie. On the side of the box, it says, if Ravenclaw fits, Ravenclaw sits box. That that is so freaking cute. I know Raven would love to sit in this box. <gasps> oh my god, look at how beautiful this is packaged. Yo, <gasps> what? I feel like I'm in Harry Potter. <gasps> oh my god, just look, just look. Stop. <gasps> and then there's another, <gasps> oh my god, there's another one. Oh my freaking gosh. Okay, okay, I'm actually going to pause this video so that I can take pictures of these parcels before I open them because they're so beautiful and I wanna make a bookstagram post. So I'm gonna do that, I'll be right back. Sorry, I, there's no way I could not put those photos on Instagram. So the first package, I'm going to assume that these are gonna be opened in order. I've already taken the ribbon off. Raven is going to love playing with this ribbon. So I'm gonna, I wanna save these packages so I'm gonna open them very carefully. What is this? This is what you want, transcendence. When that happens, oh boy, Prince. <gasps> oh my God, shut up. Oh my God. So this is conversations from the infamous artist Prince who is just non-binary finery and Prince is from Minneapolis where I live. So he's like a big deal here. Wow, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to read this. And this book apparently talks about you know, his identity, which I'm so excited about. <gasps> Shut up, oh my God, oh my God. I was not expecting this. This is freaking incredible. Stop, stop, oh my God, okay. What was next? Okay, what was the next order? Ooh, I can't remember what came next, oh no. Let's just open this one. It says, don't think you have this, but you need it. Cross those fingers that it won't be featured in a wasted my time video. <laughs> Yo, my fingers are crossed too. <laughs> Ooh, it's a hard cover. I'm gonna take it out carefully so I don't damage this. Elliot sent me The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. <gasps> Yo, okay, so, wow. Okay, I have been just really enjoying all the rave reviews of this book, but because of my trauma that I've had with hype books, I didn't want to spend money on it myself, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm just not gonna deal with it. Um, so I, I definitely would never have bought or even checked this book out from the library. So the fact that Elliot sent it, yo, that means so much to me. The cover is even more gorgeous in person. Okay, I'm genuinely freaking thrilled to read this book. I'm using neutral pronouns for Elliot because I don't know what their pronouns are. Um, so Elliot, you'll have to let me know what your pronouns are. But this one says, you love this, you have this, sorta, dot, dot, dot. You need this version, oh my God. Oh my fucking God, remove the cover, gorgeous. What do I have that has a better cover that I don't have the cover of? I don't know. I don't know what this would be. Oh, holy shit. So Elliot sent me a signed copy of Slay by Brittany Morris. I'm quiet because I'm trying not to get emotional, but y'all know that this book has meant the world to me this year. Okay, I'm just gonna move on to the next one so that I don't start crying because like, I, I can't cry in this video. Like I can't, I cry too much on this channel already. This one says, just add special for political commentary. Us special sci-fis gotta stick together. Yo, yes the fuck we do. Oh, 
I'm still not over Slay. I'm, I'm not over any of this. Elliot, this is incredible. <laughs> How to write a novel using the snowflake method by Randy Ingermanson. I have a feeling that Elliot sent this to me because I have talked about the fact that I want to author a book. So this is like the most perfect gift that I could receive for Christmas, especially because this book was not even on my radar, so huge thank you. Oh my god, I'm so freaking stoked about this. Okay, one of my favorite types of gifts to receive are the kinds of gifts that I didn't know that I needed. You know, that's probably my favorite type of gift, so this is, <laughs> this is killer. Oh, look at this ribbon. Oh, cute. They're bags of catnip for Raven. Uh, stop it, stop it, stop it. Well, Y'all know that I have my Spilling Positivity series that I do in promotion with Sip Spy. So I love that these are like Sip Spy cat tea. That is so freaking cute. Dear Ravenclaw, as Jesse unfortunately continues to neglect your tea requirements, rude, I took it upon myself to get you some catnip tea. Cute. Ravenclaw is going to freaking love this. She is currently in Wisconsin, and I'm going to send this to her promptly along along with this, the strings and don't don't worry I'm gonna include the box so that she can sit and I will share photos of her sitting in the box okay so this is the last thing in here I just like don't deserve any of this this is freaking incredible yes bubble wrap mug that says I'm Jesse's tea this is Ravenclaw and it's got a bow tie and it's got Raven on it and then it says bow ties and books on the side my little Instagram and there's this beautiful quote from Alice Walker's the color purple I am an expression of the divine just like a peach is just like a fish is I have the right to be this way I can't apologize for that nor can I change it nor do I want to. We will never have to be other than who we are in order to be successful. We realize that we are as ourselves unlimited and our experience is valid. It is for the rest of the world to recognize this if they choose. Don't think it has gone unnoticed that the colors from the non-binary flag are used on here. And I think it's really dope that there's an Alice Walker quote on this and I'm reading this, my black girl. And I'm talking. And I'm featuring this in my black girl magic vlog. There are no words for any of this. And the last present I'm going to open is from my beloved Starla. Starla, who has been my light throughout 2019. Starla, who is one of the most important people in my life. Starla, who is divine and brilliant and intelligent and beautiful and the best thing to come out of me having a booktube channel oh my god she would have this like perfectly wrapped ass presents i don't even want to mess up this wrapping paper i'm gonna do it anyway oh because christmas everything that she does is fucking perfect like do you have that friend who you're constantly in awe of because they're so just immaculate and put together and impressive and just like you're in awe of them constantly because Starla is that friend to me. Do you save wrapping paper? Because I do. It's like, it's from a gift that means a lot to me. <sighs> oh my God. Starla got me the Polar Express by Crispin Allsberg. Today is Christmas and on Christmas Eve, I posted the Joy of Christmas book tag. And in that book tag, I talked about the Polar Express and how it's like the most important book from my childhood and I don't own it, but now I do. <laughs> So this edition has keepsake ornaments and bonus audio read by Liam Neeson. This comes with an ornament from the Polar Express. I saw this last minute and thought of you. <laughs> this is <laughs> Dad Jokes, the holiday edi <laughs> edition. <laughs> Starla, <laughs> she knows I'm always making really shitty dad jokes. What did the little candle say to the big candle? I'm going out tonight. <laughs> lot in here what is going on and I don't even want to open this anymore because I just know I'm gonna I just, just gonna start crying over again okay in the comment section down below I need to talk to you so I can not cry tell me if you are a neat present opener or if you're a shredder present opener <gasps> shut the fuck up oh my fucking god 
okay, so the, th this is My Sister the Serial Killer. This was one of my favorite books from last year. And I checked it out from the library because, you know, I prefer to check library books out from the library first before I buy them. Oh, um, oh my God. And this was like a five out of five star read for me. This was amazing. Okay, so the note that she has is like the synopsis of the book and says, I think that you will love this. So Starla doesn't realize I've already read this. I honestly prefer that my friends and family buy books for me that I've already read and know that I will love. So this is like literally the perfect fucking gift and I will get to reread it and annotate it. I personally don't feel like a book belongs to me and is mine until I've marked and affected it and influenced it with my own notes. So this is, oh my fucking god. Wow, I'm so freaking excited. Starla, this is the perfect fucking gift. Uh, and just the cover. Yo, it took me forever to realize that it's like a dagger in the sunglasses. So fucking cool. Yo, I can't wait to reread this. Is this chocolate? I know you love lists is what the notes. I love that you put notes on all of these. That's fucking dope. Yo, okay. Fucking cool. So this is a notebook of stickers. It starts with today's plan of attack, date, what's most critical, what would be nice and not a chance. This is amazing. This is, I love practical gifts. I was actually with Starla when I found my gay agenda. It's, <laughs> I use it every single day and it says gay agenda. It's a pun, you know, you dad jokes. I love that I already have another list book. This is fucking perfect. This box just proves how well Starla knows me. I fucking cannot. I love how there's just like, carnage all around me i see a card cute stop so these are oh my god okay so there's a book nerd magnet which is going right the fuck on my fridge and then there are four grinch buttons i actually just finished my annual rewatching of jim carrey's the grinch and i just bought myself a pin flag for christmas so now i have a place to put all my pins this is even freaking cooler so she sent me some cards from the marvel champions card game i i'm not i'm just gonna i'm, I'm just gonna hold it spidey's going on my tree spidey's just gonna he's gonna sit there you gonna sit right there. There is also a really beautiful card that I'm going to keep to myself. Although this makes me realize that I did not um, read Elliot's card. So I'm gonna do that really quick. This, it, this says Jesse and Ravenclaw. Jesse, I finally sent this dang fan package. Oh, I'm so slow. Don't stress about powering through the books. Totally understand the TBR realness of it all. By the way, have you heard about Under the Rainbow by Celia Lasky? No, and Pew by Catherine Lacey? No. Both of these come out in 2020. They sound bow tie approved. In fact, one of the covers features a bow tie. Sold. Um, by the time you get this, I should have my first booktube video chat up that I won't delete in terror shortly after uploading. This will be attempt number three. Ugh, oh my God. Yo, starting on booktube can be so intimidating. Like, don't even, don't even stress yourself. I can't wait to watch your chat, Elliot. Um, Hope 2020 finds you and Ravenclaw doing well and that these gifts help you to keep spilling some positivity. So much beyond words to Chloe, Rachel, Elliot, and Starla for these incredible gifts. Thank you to those of you who watch my crazy ass videos and support me day in and day out. That means so much to me. It is December 26 and it is time for me to wrap up this vlog and give my final thoughts and reviews on these three books. Now y'all know that this series isn't about me just reading these books, but it's also looking at these books through a black lens and analyzing the way that black girls are represented in science fiction and fantasy. And with The Deep, I feel that blackness was represented incredibly well. I enjoyed this book from a thematic and literary level. I thought that it was brilliant, geniusly done. But because I didn't find myself connecting to the story, I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. And so I'm giving it a final rating of four out of five stars. Now, because this is the NB Book Club pick for the month, on December 29th, we are going to be having a critical discussion of this book over on the NB Book Club Instagram. So make sure you're subscribed to the Non-Binary Book Club Instagram and participate in that discussion. Now it is December 26th so I'm going to listen to the audiobook for this between now and the discussion and I'm hoping that the audiobook will help me see the story in a new light and will cause me to bump it up to five stars. So definitely stay tuned in that discussion to see what my final thoughts are on this book. When I read Queen of the Conquered by non-binary author Kate and Collender, an author that I love and respect so deeply. I don't think we really need to hear me rant about this book any more than I already have because that's what most of this video 
has been about. I do feel that Sigourney had repercussions for her actions. I do feel that she recognized the fact that she was a rapist. I think there were there was a line where she actually outright said like, yo, I'm a rapist, I'm trash. And I, I really appreciated that. I do think this book had excellent, very layered themes and was a very healthy portrayal of blackness, black skin, black beauty, excellent. All of that was a huge yes. But because of the glaring issues that I had with the writing, I'm giving this book a final rating of 2.75 out of five stars. The lowest rating a book on this series has ever received. Because I did enjoy the way that the book ended and there was a really, really dope plot twist, I am going to be reading the second book, King of the, it's not King of the Conquered, it's King of the something. And it looks like we won't be following Sigourney's perspective in that. So like fucking thank God for that. Now let's talk about, now let's talk about The Stars and the Blackness Between Them by Janata Petrus. I did finish the audiobook on this. There was representation, very detailed representation for chronic illness, disability, and incarceration. One of the characters lives with a life-threatening illness and it was delved into with a lot of compassion and depth. In terms of how this book represented black girls and their beauty, I thought that was really well done, but I unfortunately had to say that the representation for Trinidad culture and Trinidadians is inappropriate. So there has been several reviews from Trini reviewers who have said that the way that Trinidad is represented is very antiquated. There is intense misrepresentation of the Creole language. The Creole language in this book has been described as being butchered um, and the author is Trinidadian American. So she's still Trini, but the Trinidad character is not own voices. So as a black American, I can write an own voices character if that character is black and lives in America, but I can't write a character from let's say Nigeria and call that an own voices character because I'm not Nigerian, right? I've talked a lot about how blackness is a diaspora. Just because we're all black, it doesn't mean we can write each other's stories and have it be own voices. And I'm not saying this at all to diminish this author's claim on her heritage. I would never do that. I would never say that. Her identity as a Trinidadian is valid and nobody can take that away from her. But the way that she represented Trinidad was very hurtful to Trinidadian reviewers. And the only reason I was able to enjoy this book was because of my American privilege, was because of the fact that because I'm not Trini, the representation for Trinidad didn't hurt me personally. And so it's important to remember that when we have poor representation in books, it's not harmless. Books can hurt people and unfortunately this book did harm Trini reviewers. So I want to be respectful of that and because of that I am bumping my rating of this book down from five stars to four stars. Now here's the most important part of this video for my word of the day because this is the longest video I've ever posted on my channel. For the word of the day I would love it if you would comment either short or long. I need you to comment down below and tell me do you you prefer that my black girl magic vlogs be like that weekly or bi-weekly shorter vlog or did you like this long epic you know month long black girl magic vlog which do you prefer which are you going to commit and be willing to watch would you prefer a monthly vlog that's long or a weekly bi-weekly vlog that is short thank you so much for supporting bow ties and books for being a part of my dapper family it means so much to me that you watch to the end of this video Please be subscribed if you are not already and I hope to see you in my next one.